Well, now to another crisis facing America. A new documentary called Sound of the Police examines the history between black Americans and law enforcement. Here's a clip from the trailer. How these cops operate in this country has been America's dirty secret. We're in a country of fearing black people rooted all the way back into slavery. There seems to be two forms of policing in America, one for white America and another for black America. The film's director, Stanley Nelson, and Valerie Schoon joined Hari Srinivasan. Diana, thanks. Stanley Nelson, Valerie Schoon, thank you both for joining us. Um, first, Stanley, I want to ask, you have a body of work that has looked into so many different facets of African-American history and life. Your most recent documentary, um, Sound of the Police, why did you want to tackle this now? Well, I think that why I wanted to tackle it now is we started kind of right after the George Floyd moment, and uh, so many people were thinking about the police. I was thinking about the police. But I, I think that, that it wasn't clear the historic nature of the role of the police in African Americans' life. And so we wanted to try to make a film that talked about history, that, that this was not, George Floyd is not new, uh, Eric Garner is not new, the Black Panthers, you know, all of those things, all of the confrontations with police and the fraught relationship that African Americans often have with the police is not something new. It, it's almost like it was baked into the cake of the, of the United States. And so we wanted to, to detail that, but also talk about the present, but also talk about the past. Imagine if you had an institution where it was almost impossible to be held accountable. What happened with the police made me scared of them. No mother should have to bury their child. Amir Lott was killed in a botched, no-knock warrant situation. I saw the body cam footage, snuffing this man out as he slept. Valerie, um, this story is poignantly bookended from a funeral service and the comments of parents who've lost their son to police violence. But really, it is, as Stanley mentioned, a historical dive. Why take it all the way back? And what are the, why do those dots start at slavery? Well, as our interviewees, you know, point out that, you know, Law enforcement um, in the South um, was intertwined with slave patrols. And from that, um, some of the methods, methodology or um, mechanisms, you know, became part of, like Stanley mentioned, sort of baked in the cake of law enforcement. So the reason why we started in the past is that's where, you know, the relationship between law enforcement and Black people, you know, commenced. And um, and so the idea would be to sort of trace it through the through the decades or centuries to sort of see how those patterns, you know, persist in the system of law enforcement, where they do, if they do. And that was part of what we were looking at, sort of to answer the question of how did we get here? You know, Stanley, what's interesting is, is I think people in the audience might just assume, well, the slavery was kind of the problem in the South when Black people voted with their feet, so to speak, and left and went to the North, that things clearly must have been better. But what your film points out is how police in the North were also complicit in an enforcement of a different kind of segregation. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the role of, of, of the police early on in the North was to keep African Americans in their place. So African Americans had to, had to live in ghettos, and you know, if you stepped out of the ghetto, then you would be suspect, and the police would enforce that. So um, very early on, the police became feared um, for for the African American community, and um, they weren't there to kind of serve and protect. African Americans. They were there really to, to control African Americans. And the role for African American citizens, you know, from the beginning, from the 1860s until now, the role of the police for African Americans has been very different from the role for many other Americans. Now, Valerie, you point out in the film that there were so many horrendous lynchings throughout the South and other parts of the country where in the photographs, you can see that it is with the assistance of police officers who would essentially either participate and 
crowd control or would be spectators themselves or certain times would be unlocking the jail cell before the trial even started. Yes, I think that um, that was an important thing to, to include. Um, as it shows, it sort of speaks to the relationship of Black people and law enforcement that um, in, in that time period, which sort of obviously sets out the idea that they're not there to sort of protect and serve Black people if they're standing by or allowing these lynchings to take place. Um, so I think that that sowed seeds of um, of of some distrust, which I think is important to 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 look at and to sort of see how that plays a role in the relationship today in terms of um, how how black people and law enforcement are engaging today. So Stanley, tell me, how does it translate from these moments of history that we see in your film to, let's say, your life? When you were growing up as a young black man, what did your parents, what did your grandparents tell you about how to be with the police? Yeah, I, I grew up, you know, in, in New York City, and my parents told me um, to avoid the police. You know that that the best way that you could deal with the police was to avoid them. And I think there's a real parallel in that film when we talk about the fugitive slave law of 1850. And there were posters put up in the North that said, you know, Black people do not trust the police, do not talk to the police, avoid the police, because they are uh, deputized as slave catchers. And part of their job is to assist slave catchers in, 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 uh, in catching runaway slaves. Valerie, what's interesting also is here's the kind of message that the Stanleys of the world would be getting from their parents and grandparents. But the dominant narrative, as you point out, and you have this amazing montage of so many different kind of cop shows, so to speak, over the decades, and how police are painted and what we are told their role is in society. Yes, we have, you know, sort of a contrasting view. Um, as some of our experts would point out, you know, we have all these TV shows where um, everything works out, that there is, you know, um, fairness, no bias. And um, and if um, Black people are in there, you know, as they say in the, the um, in Dragnet, in the Dragnet episode, where we have, you know, uh, an active uh, goal to sort of have Black people in the show who sort of like will validate the perspective of all's well between the, in the relationship between Black people and law enforcement. But one of the very writers of that episode, you know, acknowledges that in in reality, that's not what Black people were experiencing. Um, so it's a, bit a sanitized version of what Black people were experiencing, which was not um, what was depicted on television. Yeah, I also could add that, that you know, um, it, it, it's, it's fun. Something's fundamentally wrong if if white folks can say to the, to their kids, you know, the police are your friend. If you're in trouble, go to the police. Um, you know, officer friendly will help you. And, and at the same time, a black parent of a kid the same age is saying, you know, avoid the police at all, at all costs. You know, nothing good can happen if if you even you know talk to a uh, police. I, I, used to, I, I used to tell my son, you know, if the police are walking down the block towards you and you can calmly cross the street to the other side of the street without raising their attention, you should do that. Because just by any kind of uh, contact, something negative might happen. And there's something really fundamentally wrong with policing and with our country if, if those two things exist simultaneously. Actually, I can add just that it was that was one of the reasons why I decided to work on the project. Because when Stanley first offered it, I hesitated because it's such a large and difficult project and topic. Um, and he pointed out, he asked me like, "Well, don't I have a son?" And I was like, "Oh, yes, I do." And do I worry about him? He didn't ask me this, but I reflected on the idea that I walk. I worry about him walking home. I'm like, "Do you have your ID?" And I'm trying not to infantilize him, but that fear of um, of him being out in the world, you know, was part of the reason why I wanted to work on this documentary for the sake of all the other parents and the kids and for law enforcement itself to improve the scenario. Stanley, there's a psychologist in your film that talks about how often these scenes are now being played in front of us. And I wonder 
is this kind of just becoming background noise where 20 years ago, 25 years ago, maybe before Rodney King, it was not so common to see video of it. Now everyone has a cell phone in their hand and they're shooting video of these things. I wonder what is happening to us when we see this tragedy unfold. I mean, are we becoming numb to it? Well, you know, I, I think I think in the opposite. I, I think that for, for us to solve a problem, um, we have to recognize that there is a problem. And I think that if you look at where we are today with where we were five years ago, before George Floyd and before some of the other murders, I think many more people in the United States would say, yeah, there's a problem, right? You know, as somebody says in the film, before when you would talk to your white friends, and they would say, what are you talking about? You know, and, and now nobody says, what are you talking about? You know, um, it's very clear that there is a problem. Now, have we gone as far as we, as we need to go or probably should have been by this point in solving the problem? I don't think so. But I, I just think as horrible as it is, at least we recognize, at least some people are recognizing, or more and more people are recognizing that there's a problem. And I think that's the first step for change. Valerie, you also spoke with uh, members of current or former law enforcement. Why was that important in this? Well, it's important to get their perspective on this, on the relationship and uh, the perspective and their the perspective on the problem with um, law enforcement and black people, I think, it, and we could sort of see that there's an intersection, you know, that that they understand that black people do want um, law enforcement. Many black people do want law enforcement in in the communities. They just want a law enforcement that makes them feel more protected and served. And I think that that was important to get their perspective on that. Stanley, in the film, you've got interviews with police officers uh, who talk about their experience patrolling black neighborhoods versus non-black neighborhoods. What is the logic behind their approach in doing things differently? I don't. I don't know if, if there's a, a clear logic. You know, that it, it's more that that. Um, Police departments traditionally have seen African Americans as more suspect and 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 have to be policed, you know, in in a stronger way. Have to police, have to be policed with more force, and that it carries over um, to, to police departments today. One of the things that we see, Valerie, is just the perception of how we feel about police kind of playing out in day-to-day -day life. And you have multiple examples of videos that have now become kind of famous or infamous of women that we kind of uh, you know, shorthand as Karens calling the police. And you kind of get a little bit into the psychology of how or why it's important to see that there's a group of people in society that feel the police work for them to try to work on their behalf automatically. Yes, I think we that comes in the section where we're talking about um, the fugitive slave law. Um, and during that period of time, and even be even before the fugitive slave law, you know, uh, enslaved people, white people, it was almost their legal responsibility, and in fact, it was their legal responsibility to report on any black person that they felt was out of place. Um, so they could they would be seen as suspicious or um, guilty before being proven innocent. And it was their sort of responsibility to constantly report on black people and to feel that the, the police and they were allied in that or the law enforcement at that time were allied with white people in doing that. And so when we look at the section on Karens, we're, we're, we're tracing the idea that um, this idea that the that's their police that you know that 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 these women you know feel like the police are their police and they can call them when they have a doubt about you or they are questioning why you should be there um, and that trend of feeling like the police are their police and they can call them um, to call you to account um, is part of what we were uh, addressing in that section. Stanley, of all the thousand plus uh, police 
homicides that happen or police murders that happen every year, disproportionately affecting uh, black men or men of color, that 98%, 98% of the cases, police officers are not charged with a crime. And you have a section in there about how the role of unions continues that cycle. Yeah, I mean, that was really important to me to, to talk about unions, because I think, you know, when we think about the, the problem with policing um, and how it can get better, we don't think about the unions as much as, as we, we should. I mean, and, and we have a section where we, we see the unions uh, defending the murder of, of Eric Garner. I mean, one of the things that the union representative says in New York, you know, um, is, is if you can cry for help, then you can breathe. And, and you know, it's just a, uh, a very callous thing to say when this man was choked to death. But the, but the unions are that part of what they're, they're supposed to do, part of their duty is to defend the police, and they defend the police no matter what. And they defend the police, and they have not only statistics, um, they have the, 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 uh, the person who might have been murdered, their record, they have their family's record, they have money, um, and, and, they're, and they're cops, and, they, and they're believed. And so... Um, we felt it was really important that we talk a little bit in this film about the unions and the power of the unions and, and the power of the unions to shape um, public opinion um, when these uh, horrible things happen. Stanley, what's your hope for people watching this film? I think that, 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 they'll, um, that the door will be open just a little bit wider and that they will see the the more and more the problems, and they will understand that change is necessary and that change is possible. You know, that, that, that there, there is a way that we can have law enforcement and, and it not be such a fraught relationship, but that we understand that, that certain things, again, were baked into the cake, and, and we understand how we can get that out of law enforcement. Valerie? Yeah, I I want people to sort of see that you know out of discomfort um, can come change, that change could come. I you know obviously it's difficult to look at this um, this this relationship, but the reason why we want to look at it is to improve it and to um, and I believe that you know that's my hope that by looking at this that this will be part of a conversation starter um, that people can sort of move forward to, to improve that relationship. Sound of the Police is now streaming on Hulu. Co-directors Stanley Nelson and Valerie Schoon. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.